Well, Suzanne, I think we should get started, yeah? Okay. So I first wanna welcome you all. Um, Thank you so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon. My name is Julia Himberg. I'm the Director of Film and Media Studies. And today, as you probably know, our panel is on internships, resumes, and portfolios. And this is a topic that we decided to focus on after um, many of our students, some of them may have been you in our last panel, um, asked questions about this and wanted to know more. Um, and that was on the last panel that we had on social media networking, which by the way, um, you can watch on the department's YouTube channel. Um, and once we get started, I will also put the link to that in there um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to attend it live um, because it also may be very helpful. So with all of our alumni focused panels, um, this one too is really designed to give you information and ideas about some of the steps you can take to set yourself up for entry into a media career um, and to hear from our alumni and get advice from them. And also it's a chance for you to ask questions. So um, one, if there are other topics you'd like to hear about in future panels, please feel free to write them in the chat. Um, and also as we go along, please also feel free to write questions about this topic in the chat um, and we will get to as many as we can in the Q&A. Um, so let me then introduce you to our two moderators. They are current FMS students. Um, they've agreed to moderate today's session, which we are tremendously grateful for. Um, and they're the ones who are going to introduce you to our panelists and then we'll get started. So again, if you have questions along the way, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. So our first moderator is Alex Botello, and Alex is a senior at ASU who is majoring in film and media studies while also interning at the Walt Disney Company in Orlando, Florida. Right now, he is amid research on discourse relating to RuPaul's Drag Race season 15, in addition to looking at LGBTQ plus representations in production spaces. And post-graduation, Alex will remain at the Walt Disney Company and begin his MA at the University of Central Florida in the spring of 2024. Our second student moderator, Sophia Ryland, is a senior graduating this spring in 2023 with a BS in biomedical sciences and a minor in film and media studies. And after graduation, she hopes to obtain both an MPH and a JD through a dual degree program and, wor and work in public health policy. She loves film and media studies um, as I hope most of us here do, if not all of us, um, and will continue thinking about and analyzing media post-graduation. So Sophia, I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and now I have the honor to introduce Autumn Malhotra. Uh, Autumn graduated from ASU in December of 2022 with a bachelor's in film and media studies. She is currently working as a television production apprentice at MPT. She is a certified sound engineer with experience in music and vocal editing, Foley, sound mixing, and recording using various software tools. She has also worked as a production assistant, boom operator, and production and social media assistant, and has experience in event production and technical support both in front of and behind the camera. Hi everybody, I'm Autumn, nice to meet you. All right, so next I have the pleasure of introducing um, our next two panelists. So our first panelist, Brandon Marlowe. So Brandon, class of 2014, Brandon obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Film and Media Studies from ASU and relocated to California where he worked in the entertainment industry for a number of years on productions for platforms such as Netflix and HBO Max. In 2019, Brandon and his partner founded Rainbow Media Co., an LGBTQ plus medium production company with a massive following of 10 million individuals across multiple social media platforms. And RMC now operates the most followed queer accounts globally and generates hundreds of millions of views annually through its expansive distribution network. Next, we also have Ruby Maxud. So <clears throat> Ruby is the Department of English Director for Internships 
and uh, she'll be presenting information on internship opportunities uh, on campus and online resources and how to take your experiences as a student now and translate them onto your resume and portfolio. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, now give the platform over to our three panelists. Thank you, Alex. Um, so I'm going to, um, well, first off, thank you for having me here today. It's great to join the conversation. And I'm just going to share my screen here. There we go. Can everyone see that all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so today I'm just going to go through and talk a little bit about the sort of practical side of uh, internships, uh, how to find internships or explore internships, and then how to create a standout resume and portfolio along the way. Oh, sorry, not working. There we go. Um, so one of the things we hear time and time again from industry professionals is that internships are a big deal. Um, so we know from uh, various studies and research across the U.S. that 93% of executives and 94% of hiring managers um, would like to hire a recent graduate who has had an internship or an apprenticeship. So it is something that employers are looking for um, in your resume, during interviews. Um, so internships are a really great way to kickstart your uh, career pathway and your career readiness. So one of the things that I like to talk to students about, um, specifically when they're looking for internships, is how important it is to be uh, your greatest advocate. Um, so to be very proactive when you're looking for um, internships. So one of the uh, easiest or for, sort of straightforward ways to kind of get started is to take a look at the people around you. Um, so working with uh, uh, career professionals, um, come see me in the English department. Um, there are tons of people around you right now, faculty, um, staff at ASU, uh, and you can talk to different people to start networking and connecting with those local and national and global opportunities. Um, you know, sometimes people have projects on the side, you can tap into their network circles. So it's a really good way to reach out and be proactive and ask um, if anyone knows of any really great opportunities. Another really good strategy is to create a professional profile. And so many of you may already have this, um, but you might want to go into LinkedIn. Um, there are some other really great resources and spaces like Women in Film or Production Hub that have you um, there uh, able to connect on forums, have conversations with industry professionals. You can uh, find out about internships and jobs. You can find out about mentorship opportunities. Um, you can even schedule and talk to people about possibly doing informational interviews where you can um, spend some time with them, asking them what aspects of their job or their work that they really like. And through those conversations, um, you might then be able to uh, find out about really interesting opportunities that you can apply for. And I've seen time and time again, students who've done in informational interviews or connected with network, uh, sorry, industry professionals and started that networking circle, um, they've managed to get internships and opportunities um, that aren't even advertised. It's just through conversations, just through talking with people. Another really good strategy uh, in terms of advocating for yourself and being very proactive with finding an internship is customizing an internship. And sometimes students forget to do this. But if there's a company or an organization that you're really interested in that really matters to you, is doing good work, somebody that you want to work with, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Do a little bit of research. Check their website out. Look for their careers tab or join our team tab. Look to see if they've got anything on their website or advertised somewhere. Um, that you can then tap into and reach out to those people and ask uh, if there are any opportunities that are coming up or that, you know, if there's someone that they can, they can put you in touch with. 
And it's a really good way for you to practice talking about your academic training, your professional experiences, and also what your goals are so that by the time you get to graduation, you're feeling um, career ready. And that practice element is really important because people don't have a ton of time. So you want to be able to talk about yourself and what your goals are in a very clear and relatable way in a matter of minutes. Um, so that's going to be really important to be specific and focused on who you are, what you bring to the table, and what you're looking to do. So in terms of exploring possibilities, um, there are some real uh, excellent resources uh, where you can start today, you can start looking for internship opportunities. And these are sort of the nuts and bolts of, of the online resources. Um, so I've put together a list of, of resources that I know uh, students have used that have been successful that I use to find internships for students and to connect with different people. One of them is right here um, in the English department. It's the Department Internships and Careers Facebook page. Um, you don't have to be on Facebook to be able to access these uh, postings. They're there. They're public. Um, you can check every week. We post uh, new uh, uh, postings every week, listings, um, events, uh, there might be workshops, career events, talks also posted on there. So definitely keep your eye on that. Um, another really great resource right here at ASU is ASU Handshake. And some of you may already be on that portal. You can create a very professional uh, profile for yourself. And there are thousands of listings there. And not just for internships, there are jobs there. Um, so it's a really good way for you to start exploring. You can use the filters to identify um, um, whether you want it to be in a specific location, if you want a remote internship, um, you can put together your professional profile and invite employers to reach out to you based on your skill set. So that's a really nice way, again, to really advocate for yourself and be proactive um, instead of waiting for an internship to come to you, but you're going after those experiences and Handshake is a really great resource for that. Um, another really good uh, experience that I that a lot of students have had in the last few years, especially during the pandemic, has been virtual internships. Um, and one of the ways that you can create that kind of global fluency is by ASU's global virtual internships. And those are offered through the ASU Global Education Office. Um, and their website is right there at Kappa. We've had a lot of uh, film and media studies students working um, based here in the US uh, and working around the country, around the globe, I'm sorry, and looking at uh, working with different organizations and companies uh, in Europe and South America and Australia. So it's really been a very uh, great way to kind of take your experience and go global with that. These are some dot-com resources. So these are exactly what you can imagine. These are searchable databases, where they take some time. Um, so you want to kind of roll up your sleeves and get in there and explore uh, the internships that are there. Um, it takes a little bit of creativity in figuring out keywords to make internships that pop out that are really connected to what you want to do and you know, the experiences that you want to have. Um, so when you have some time, take a look at some of these .com resources, and some of these may already be familiar to you. There, they, there may be others, and that's great. These, this is not just a complete list. Um, it was all that I could fit on the screen. Um, but yes, the, these ones are really good for finding internships that are based in LA, uh, around the country. Um, you can filter things to come and pop out depending on where you're geographically located. So if you are in a particular state, you can filter for uh, film and media studies, internships that are uh, focused in on that particular geographical area. You can also look for experiences that are remote and virtual. Um, so there's a lot of really great opportunities out there. Um, you can even, Take on a paid internship by filtering that. You know, don't you? It doesn't always have to be unpaid, but look for those paid internships. Um, so there's lots of ways for you to customize uh, these databases and uh, allow those internships to kind of emerge and come through, depending on what your uh, experience is, where, where you're hoping to be. Okay. One of the really 
good things to think about when you are exploring those databases is yes, finding an opportunity that is that's something that you want to do, something that's exciting to you, something that's going to help develop a career pathway, um, build your networking circle for sure. And one thing that you want to keep in mind when you are looking at these databases is um, instead of just collecting a number of these internships as you go, be very purposeful in the ones that you're looking at and read the descriptions carefully. Uh, make sure that when you are looking at that internship description, that it seems like something that you can do, um, that you're not just going to, to send out 35 resumes to any opportunity that says internship, but read the description carefully and try to tailor uh, your idea of what you want to do and what your skill set is to that description. So that'll help you to build or create a resume that really stands out. So one of the things I often see with students when they are coming into my office and showing me their resume is how general it is. Um, so some students are at different stages. So some students are just at the beginning and may not have a ton of experience and that's okay. You can find very creative ways to highlight that. Um, that you do have experience, that you're looking for experience. And a lot of these internships know that you're starting out, that you know, you're new, you're not going to be this seasoned, very experienced person coming into the internship. So there is that mentorship component, there is that element that they are expecting you to come in and you, that you're going to learn as you go. That's the whole purpose of an internship in terms of experiential learning, right? And then there are other students who have experiences, who've done multiple internships, and then they can highlight all of those details. But in an, any case, um, a sample internship description that I, I pulled from a local film festival from last year is this one. And here they just identify, I've, I've just kind of um, taken an excerpt of it, but here they've identified the actual tasks of what the intern's going to be doing. So um, essentially you're working for the film festival, you're going to be developing print and online content. And you can see here that um, they've identified what you're actually gonna be doing. So you're gonna be interviewing, so you can see that coming up there. Um, you're gonna be writing articles, you're gonna be developing content for the website. Um, you're going to be doing daily on-camera interviews um, and then some, again, some major content development for their website and for the event in general. So when you look at a description like this, you want to look at uh, whether they're asking for specific skills and do you identify with those skills? Do you feel like, yes, I this sounds like something that I can do or that I'm willing to learn to do? And then the actual tasks that they're asking you to do. Do you have experience in these tasks or um, are they things that you can highlight on your resume, showcase and say, I've taken classes, um, I have done an extracurricular project, I have done some volunteer work. So I don't have that maybe um, official job or work experience, but I've done enough things around these ideas or these tasks where I can uh, highlight this on my resume. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, so these are some transferable skills that uh, in general, our students uh, tend to have. So there, there may be others, of course, um, and everyone's unique in terms of their skill set. But you know, problem solving, critical thinking skills. These are skills that you're developing in your program. Um, good written and verbal communication, leaders, leadership skills, uh, digital technology, use of software, use of equipment, um, teamwork and collaboration. So these are all things that you want to be thinking about. So where, where are your transferable skills? What are you learning in the classroom? What is your academic training giving you? And then how does that map into the world beyond ASU and onto your resume? And how are you going to describe that or demonstrate that um, on your resume? So when you're thinking about creating a resume, uh, one of the things you got, you've got to remember is that a lot of companies are going to be using applicant tracking systems. So these are bots. They process resumes uh, that come in, um, and there are some big companies that use these, um, these bots. 
So the important thing on your resume is to go back to that description that you found and to draw out the exact same words that the description uses and to bring them back into your resume. So when you are highlighting experiences or you're talking about your objective or your goal in finding an internship, you want to repeat those key words that are in the description because the companies are giving that description to the bot and they're basically screening your resume and looking for those identical keywords. So when you're looking at those descriptions, pull out those keywords and recycle them and put them onto your resume. And that also is true for your cover letter. Um, and that way, what ends up happening is your resume, your cover letter matches the wording in the internship description, and then you've got a, a better rate of passing through their system and then getting in front of a human. And that is where the real action happens. So there's a couple of um, platforms you can use to check. Um, so JobScan is one that I know students have used in the past. Um, and you can actually cut and paste your resume and stick it into JobScan and the description. And what it'll do is scan and it'll tell you what your rate of matching is for the words. And you want to have strong overlap between your resume and the job description, again, so that you can get past those bots. Okay. It's just a reality now. Um, you know, a, a company may get, um, you know, 300 applications and they don't necessarily have a human being who's going through that first process, right? So you want to want to be aware of how to, to kind of, you know, get past that bot. Um, another really important thing that sometimes students forget to put on their resume that really helps you to stand out is an objective statement. Um, so if you have limited professional work experience, an objective statement is what you want to include to talk about what you're hoping to do, what you want to do. Um, if you already have a lot of professional work experience or just enough, then you want to include a summary. And basically, that is just a highlight of the key points uh, related to your work experience. They're slightly different. Um, so you want to think about where you're at with your professional experience and then choose either a, an, an objective statement or a resume, a resume summary. And that statement should come right below um, where you've put your name and your contact details at the top. The next thing should be either the objective statement or the resume summary. Okay. And also consider the order of your sections. If you've got a lot of uh, industry experience already, then that should go first. That should be the first thing that employers see because that's your that, that's important. That's the, that's the part of your resume, the top half, that the employer is going to look at first and focus on. So put the good stuff there first. Um, but if you don't have a ton of experience and you know, you're studying and it's perfectly okay because you know, you're a student and you're in, in the program, um, then put your education first and highlight some relevant classes. Um, so maybe if you've taken, you know, a particular class or uh, a writing class or a theory class or some class that you feel really is connected to that job description and what they're asking for, then you can write out a couple of relevant classes that you've taken. Don't put all of them. <laughs> so just put a sample. Okay, that's the main thing. Another really important thing that um, I think really helps you to stand out with your resume that sometimes students forget is to be able to put both your hard skills, any kind of technical skills that you have, like you're able to use camera equipment, you have digital fluency with a particular video editing software, um, and also your soft skills. So these are the things that you kind of just gain from being a human being in the world, like your ability to build professional relationships and that you can stay productive under time pressure or stressful situations. So highlight both sets of skills, not just the hard skills and not just the soft skills, but a mix is really important. Um, another really uh, great way to, to highlight or to, to bring into action your resume is to uh, take a look at specific skills in the job description or um, specific experiences that the employer is looking for. And again, write that in your resume. If you have it, of course, um, highlight that. Again, use the same language. Um, be sure to use strong action verbs. Like, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, I uh, wrote or 
I um, uh, analyzed, just say analyzed, wrote, um, you know, interviewed. Um, so that really just helps to make it much more um, active based and make, again, I cannot stress enough, make as many connections as you can back to that description because when that employer is reading your resume, you want them to feel like, hey, this resume really matches up very nicely with the job description I was looking for, the internship description I was looking for. Um, there's some debate about this, but keep your resume and your cover letter to one page. Um, people are very tight for time, so you want to keep it to one page. Um, and that might mean removing some experiences or limiting things that you put on your resume and that's just the way it's going to be. And one page, I think, is a is a very good target. Um, very important check for accurate spelling and punctuation um, because that can can actually get you into the no pile pretty quickly. Especially if you um, spelt someone's name incorrectly or address someone incorrectly. So make sure you do your research and check your at your accuracy of the information that you've got there. Keep your resume nice and clean and simple, very easy to read in under 15 seconds, because once you get past that bot, you're going to be in front of somebody who's reading a stack of resumes. So you want to make it easy for them. Think about your audience, balance your margins, um, you know, maybe bold your professional titles, use different sized font, um, use consistent font. So if you choose one type of font, do that for the entire resume. Try not to mix it up um, because then it's just not easy on the eyes for some people. Okay. And most importantly, too, remember, and somebody was talking about this a little earlier, remember that you're storytellers. So your resume should tell your story, uh, not necessarily, you know, the companies you've worked for or dropping names of people that you've worked for, but it's about you. It's about you and your story through your experiences, your education, and your skills. So be purposeful and consistent in what you put on your resume and try not to have anything there that's just, you know, thrown in there um, or random, but everything you can, it, that you have in your resume should tie back to that job description. And there are going to be times, I can tell you this right now, where you're going to have to have multiple resumes for different internship um, applications or job applications. Um, you can have a basic uh, resume that you then build on in different directions, depending on what the employer is looking for. Okay. Now, this is all also tied into uh, your portfolio. And I know I'm two minutes over, so I'll just uh, quickly go through this. Um, but yes, creating a portfolio is a very good way to visually present uh, your resume, your experiences, and again, who you are. So this is essentially a professional website, and it's of your best work, and it's a sample of your best work. So you don't want to give everything. So if you uh, have written something, just a couple of examples or a couple of pages, um, if you've got, you know, a, an amazing portfolio of photography or videos, um, you know, or, you know, show reels in any way, just small clips, a little taster um, that can give the employer a sense of, again, who you are, and it, it's a nice complement to your resume. Um, and that way, it's a very nice package when they are looking at your resume. Um, there are several, uh, and some of them free, internet-based internet platforms that will help you design your professional portfolio, and I've just listed a few there. You can use Wix, you can use Format, um, you can use ArtStation, WordPress even. Um, Vimeo is good for video. Um, some of them are paid, some of them are free, so you want to check to see what's important to you. Of course, there's ASU Digication, which is free and accessible to students forever. Um, so feel free to take a look at some of those um, platforms. Uh, some of them have a learning curve. You may already be using some of these. So see, see what par, um, platform look is best for you and then choose the one that really has the aesthetic and the presentation that you, you want to have for employers. Um, another really good thing to remember is your privacy settings. So make sure that you set that according to your comfort level. And uh, don't forget to add your link to your resume. Um, that's super important. I know it sounds like such a simple thing, but I've had students come in with their resumes and I've said, where's the link to your portfolio? And they're like, oh yeah. 
So um, the resume is, is where you want to put in a link to your portfolio. Um, you can add the, the link to your portfolio under your professional profiles, on your social media channels. And that way, whoever has the link or has access to the site can go in and they can look around and they can see uh, the work that you're doing. Um, so portfolios aren't always necessary. Um, sometimes you'll see in the job or internship descriptions that um, the, the basic application materials are cover letter and resume, sometimes just resume, sometimes resume and portfolio, and sometimes just portfolio. So it's kind of a mix. And it, again, it goes back to that description. So you want to make sure that you read those descriptions carefully and then send in, create those materials and send in um, what is the best package that they're looking for. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you for the extra five minutes, you guys. And, um, and I'll leave it now on to Alex and uh, feel free uh, to ask any questions as this conversation goes on. Thanks. Thank you so, so much, Ruby. I know that's super insightful as a current FMS student and um, wherever you're at, these are actually tools that are really, really vital and um, important. I know here at Disney, they tell us that the average recruiter takes about seven seconds looking at your resume. So having those active words, margin spaces and everything ready for the bot and for uh, in-person uh, uh, viewing is really, really super important. Um, so thank you so much for that. All right, so now we're going to go into our uh, questions for our panelists. And um, this these questions uh, go for both our panelists as well as any, um, any professor, anyone who's here. Um, so without further ado, we'll jump into those. And please feel free to uh, continue asking questions in the chat. Um, and yeah, so our first question is, uh, so... There are millions of resumes and portfolios that are submitted to employers every day. What are things that uh, you did on your resume and or portfolio that helped you stand out to potential employers? So um, Autumn, Brandon, what are things uh, that you guys did to kind of um, set you guys apart from um, other candidates for uh, higher jobs or where you guys are at now? Okay, I'll, I'll start off, I guess. Um, I'm trying to think back now. My mind is drawing a blank at this moment. I had to go through and do a couple versions of, actually, when I say a couple, I mean like 10, 12 versions of my resume. Um, like Ruby was saying, like personalizing it to each job that I was going for. I had to go through each and every single one and pull out like what the job, job description had and try to incorporate that and see like does my experience line up with this? Can I honestly say I can do this? And so um, one thing I tried to do with my cover letter specifically is I tried to add more humor and more of myself into it because for me doing the resumes and stuff, it seemed pretty impersonal sometimes where I'm just like, oh, I'm just trying to get this out. I'm just trying to get a job. But I wanted them to see like what I'm like as well. And that also is kind of what I did in my resume too. I added a bit more color because I feel like I'm a colorful person. You know, I like you know, different things. I didn't want it to just be like a simple, you know, black and white resume. And also we're in media and film, so it's okay to do that here. Um, so I added a bit of my own flair and design to like my actual resume and the format and layout. I did my best to keep it concise and interesting um, and I added some personal details and, and stories that I thought were funny. Uh, obviously, I think it's funny. I think I'm funny, but I don't know if they did. But I thought it was funny. And I put it in my cover letter. And um, I actually talked to some of the people that I work with now. And they mentioned some of the things that I said. And um, they, in the interview, they seemed to really enjoy, you know, going over those things. And it was like conversation starters, like some of the things I mentioned. So I think trying to add a bit of yourself into it. I know it seems like, you know, hard work and treasury, just going through trying to find something you can do, but try to make it something that's fun for you and, and represents you, not just, you know, a list of your work, but like who you are as a person. Okay. That's my two cents. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think having that master copy and then making that adaptable and pulling and adding your, you know, personal self and just who you are is really, really important. Um, what about you, Brandon? Uh, just curious, um, something that you did to your resume or your portfolio that kind of help you stand out or get to where you're at now? 
It's been a while since I've had to do a resume, but the one thing that I did that was very unique to um, my application was I really tailored them. Like I would Photoshop the resumes. So especially in entertainment, you have to do anything you can to set yourself apart. Um, so this is, I'm going to give kind of a two-part answer. One, in entertainment, most jobs come really un non-traditionally. So submitting to a website, say NBC Universal, for instance, which is where my first internship was technically through, but I submitted my resume after watching the credits for a show, I looked for PAs that I could send my resume to. So it wasn't going to um, a platform that like Ruby said, a bot was trying to place certain words and compartmentalize me. So I had a little bit more ability to create a PDF version of my resume. Like one of them was it, me standing there with thought, thought bubbles and information about myself. So really not traditional. Um, another one that I did when I interned for E! News was um, really specific to the content they were producing. So I would, I would write information in my cover letter about a specific segment that they did that I liked or how um, like my skill set might be adaptable to that thing. Um, so like one of them was transcribing. So I actually included like how quickly I could transcribe. Um, so they knew because that's a huge back end part of the news cycle is trans transcribing. Um, so it's not a glamorous piece, but it's something that was very applicable to them and something they could be looking for. So the first part is try and get your resume to a person. So whatever you have to do in terms of looking for anyone in the credits, anyone in the back of a book acknowledgement. I always say never family and never friends. Like as long as it's professional, you can reach out to those people, find an email address, send a DM on Instagram. But if you can get your resume to a person, even if it's not directly related to the job that you want, they're gonna have access to that person. So just keep that in mind when you're sending applications out. Thanks for those great answers, you guys. Um, our next question that I want to focus on is how can students start putting together portfolios or resumes while they're still in school? And I think that sort of connects with a question that I'm seeing in the chat um, where someone says they're a film and media studies minor. Um, and they're curious to see how our panelists would recommend getting work during undergrad. Um, I'll, I'll start on this one if that's okay on them. Um, the great thing about your entry point into your career is that you have full control over it now. So when I was graduating in 2014, you were still really beholden to anyone giving you an opportunity. And now you all can create your own opportunities. With social media, there's really no excuse for you not to be um, leveraging it outside of, you know, personally. So if, for instance, if you want to be, if you're, degree is in FMS and you want to be a critic or a reviewer, there's no reason you're not on TikTok after seeing a new movie that comes out on Friday and immediately going home and doing a review. Uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels is a guy who, it's called C3 Films or 3C Films, and he just does roundups of the movies and that is his career now. So he left his job and is doing that full time. There's a lot of intersection between opportunities and social media now and you can be creating those for yourself. So it may not be something that you are getting a monetary benefit from, but it's building your own experience and your own resume in a way that's linkable to people. So if you do have someone that's interested in, so that's kind of the portfolio element as well, you can say, oh, well, I actually have examples here of the work that I do. Start a blog, um, you know, leverage, what's available to you right now while you're in school, maybe your time is limited and you're working another job um, and there's not crossover right now between how you can make money and what you're interested in. You can do that on the side from the comfort of your bed, basically. So it's just about applying your time to it. I think that's really great advice. And just to, you know, get creative with the work that you're doing at all times. Autumn, do you have any ideas about creating a portfolio? Sure. Like, I really love what you said, Brandon, about like making your own opportunities, because that is so true. 
Like for me specifically, um, a lot of my opportunities can be traced back to being in school and collaborating with my um, uh, classmates. And like specifically when I was getting certified in sound engineering, a lot of the projects that I first worked on were my classmates projects. I was doing background vocals. I was running sessions with them. And then I was always on my professor's back about, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? What can I do? What can I be involved in? You know, and um, the thing, the great thing about ASU is that so many of the professors are working still like they are like the ones that I had and ones that I talked to they're working in the industry had worked in the industry still doing their own things and I feel like they're a great resource when it comes to finding out what you could possibly be doing while in school my professor um, let me know of multiple opportunities where I could you know go and sing background vocals or work here and there he actually got my first internship at a radio station for me he got me in touch with um the there's a radio station in my area you guys probably won't know it but um that's how I was able to start getting work while I was in school it was just like really hounding the people around me and the people around you as well like students and stuff they're going to want to be looking for things too so since you guys are all in the same field you could collaborate together make your own things like we I made a uh, short film with some of my classmates. I was I starred in some of my classmates' short films. So use each other as uh, worker bees and you know sources of making your own opportunities. Because that is like so smart. You can't wait for oh the right thing to fall in that says I'm looking for a job description that says we're looking for a current student or whatever. You need to like start doing it yourself now, and then it will come obviously. So I love that, Brandon. That was perfect. And can I, I just want to piggyback then on what you just said, um, because seeing Christopher Bradley here made me just think of this. So there was a uh, script that I had to write, I think it was 40 pages for, I can't remember, you didn't have to complete the script um, for the class, and I never did. And I was talking about it recently to one of my friends who owns a production company that does um, sci-fi horror films, and I told him of this idea, and he's like, oh, well, can I see the script. And I'm like, oh, it's not done. So a lot of the, the things that you're going to do in class aren't going to be mandatory for you to finish in order to complete the class and get your grade. But finish those projects, like make that commitment to yourself that just because your professor doesn't require it to be finished, like you, you're you putting the work in. How much do you, do you love what you're going to be doing? Because no one, once you graduate, is holding your hand telling you, we really need you to get this done. Like you get into the job and if you don't do it, you get fired. So you really have to have that like self-starting, um, like internal activation, especially in entertainment. And something else in that same vein is when Ruby was going through your skills for classes, there are going to be a lot of skills that maybe you don't have to have for certain classes, or maybe you're not doing a production class and you're doing more of the studies classes you can still be teaching yourself things like Photoshop. There are so many free courses online now that learning doesn't just come in the classroom. And so building your po portfolio up that way as well. Um, like I'm learning how to use Premiere right now. And just for no other reason that I would like to have that skill or Adobe InDesign. There are a lot of things that you can put on a resume that you don't have to have a college credit for that you, you can complete courses online and get accredited that way. So also be thinking about those things, how you can be building your own portfolio and your your skills outside of the classroom. Sweet. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, I think, yeah, building your network and relying on your network, especially during your undergrad, is super, super important, um, as well as, you know, just kind of getting some skills while you have opportunities when you're undergrad and, you know. Um, we're going to jump into the next question. So uh, in the chat we received, I'm a film media studies minor myself, and I was curious to see how you guys would recommend getting more um, work during your undergrad experience. So maybe a little bit besides relying on your network, where are some things that um, either Autumn, you or Brandon, you kind of did um, besides maybe necessarily relying on your network uh, to help you get those uh, experiences? This is something that isn't... Um necessarily work but in a in a way i'm just gonna talk through what i'm trying to say when i was in school one of the things that i tried to do was engage with all of the classmates and like what their parents do what their aunts and uncles do 
you know, just letting people know you have to really put yourself out there and what you want to do. So they're thinking about that, you know, it's at the forefront of thought where if, oh, well, a, a radio show, for instance, like Autumn just said, oh, I actually have a cousin who is interning there now, or you have to be really confident in what you're looking to achieve because also entertainment is not for the meek. Like you have to be consistently putting yourself out there and be willing to either be rejected or just not, not have opportunities come. Um, but the more that you do it and the more consistent and persistent you are with talking about what you're interested in, what you want to be doing, the more likely someone is to think about you when, when something does come up in conversation or, um, and, and they come in, in weird ways as well. I was at lunch yesterday and there was, a an ASU student who was my server and I asked him what he wanted to do, his degrees in business um, and something else, but he wants to create cold plunge tubs. So while we're talking about this, it seems totally unrelated. But I'm like, well, you know, ASU has an industrial design school. You should go meet a couple of kids there so they can help you design the concept. Then you should go over to the sustainability college to see the best way that you could insulate this product. Like there are a lot of ways that you can connect with people even outside of film and media on campus and you just have to leverage leverage who's around you i agree with that like another point i wanted to add to that that's kind of along the lines um is like using your school too because asu has internships and jobs on campus that you can work and for me like i was an online student so i didn't work at asu but at my initial college that I went to that I um, was in person for at University of Maryland, there was something called student entertainment events there. And that's where I got my first production jobs. I got paid to help set up for the events that were happening there. And I got to put that on my resume for other jobs that I went for after that. But it was very easy to just go in and say, hey, I'm a student. I'd like to work. Like there was really no interview. And I'm assuming, I don't know, I'm sure that some of the professors and other people who are in person can say like there is stuff at ASU where you can just walk up basically and say, I want to work, I want a job, I want to help with these events or whatever. And you can get those experiences very easily just because you go to the school. Is that true? Am I lying? Can somebody, I don't no. know, back me up or that's tell me? Them? Yeah, no, that's that's very true. Um, and, you know, there are a, a official positions on the student employment page um, at ASU that you can keep an eye on. Or, um, again, just talking to different people, uh, knowing what kinds of events are going on and reaching out to people, uh, keeping an eye on those events pages at ASU and seeing if you can, like you said, help out um, with an event, um, you know, even if there's like a, a local film festival going on over a three or four weekends, that could be something that you can do as well. It's all resume building experience. Yeah. And can I just say, I said, I did a, one of these panels a couple of months ago and you have to be going to your professor's office hours. Like I just can't drive that home enough. And it's not for when you have a problem and it's not for just when you need help with an assignment, like get to know your professors. It's like any other relationship. It seems like there's a disconnect because they're an authority, but they're also people who have connections and who want to help people who are showing up. So you can't expect a professor who you've built no rapport with when you reach out your senior year to go to bat for you. You know, there's, there's no depth, there and there are other students who they've built relationships with and spent time with and gotten to know so for god's sakes go to those office hours they're there for a reason and a lot of your professors are very knowledgeable and they're cool people and i have a few that i've maintained personal relationships with after graduating and that was almost 10 years ago so you again you just never know where those opportunities are going to come up and i know when you're in school you just think like god i don't want to go sit in there and talk to Julia Hamburg, I was just in class, but she's like a source of information and knowledge outside of what she's teaching. And she's like a rad person. So, and a lot of the professors are. Actually, Christopher Bradley, after I graduated, I was still sending him a script that I was working on and he was still giving me notes on it. He's not getting paid to do that. Like he was doing it because there was a mutual investment. I showed up to his office hours. I, I asked how his day was going. You know, those are things you need to be doing. And because it's going to translate outside of outside of your higher education 
That's great to do when you get on staff. If you're a PA on a, on a TV show, check in with people, you know, see how they're doing. It's, you have to be really consistent in your communication. So that's such great advice. Um, I think it's very helpful. Um, to move the conversation forward, uh, here's another chat question um, that's really wondering about uh, how to connect different skills together. And they're asking, how does a writing focused portfolio differ from a more visual arts-based resume? Um, and they're wondering how they can present written projects alongside film and photo projects, which I, I think, Brandon, you've said some interesting things so far about um, really getting creative with the resumes and portfolios that you are submitting. Well, and just when I hear that question, my first thought is if you're a writer, but there's a visual element, again, like looking at what other colleges and degrees are available and how you might leverage another student who needs who needs what you're doing. So if you're a great writer and you're doing a short story and this person's an animator and maybe they need something for a project, having them illustrate the short story, putting that online again, like it all goes back to you were, you were kind of your own boss starting very young now and you were able to self produce and it doesn't have to be something that's expensive. You know, there are a lot of ways that you can very cheaply start um, like, Ruby said a Wix page, you know, start your own website where you're doing a blog, where you are self publishing, whether it be your illustrations um, or any other creative medium. Like I, I had a, a person reach out recently about a job and we were just kind of talking personally about social media because I own a social media company. And what I basically told them is now your name is, is your brand. So if your name is, is it Sophia Ryland? That's if it's incorrect. Sorry, Sophia. Um, but at Sophia Ryland on Instagram, like that is what you're presenting to the world. Like your Finsta is now your new real Instagram. So whatever you're putting there, if it's say you want to do something in wellness, there are there's a lot of content you can capture and create that is lending itself to your online portfolio, which is basically your Instagram handle now. It's the first thing I look at. And if it's if it's private and there's no other content there for me for me to review, then I'm going right to the next person because I don't care about like what you had for breakfast. I'm sad, you know, sorry to say, but the way that social media should be used now is to really give an indicative view of who you are and what you're offering. So, social media really is so interconnected with our lives now and you're really presenting yourself um, and how you want to be viewed, especially by employers at all times. Um, Autumn, do you have anything you'd like to add about uh, creating almost like uh, mixed medium portfolios and, and even how to bring in social media and how you're being viewed by the wider world into these sorts of things? Sure. Um, I would definitely say before you start looking for jobs, scrub your social media <laughs> in a way. Um, just be sure that everything you have posted to the public is something that you can stand behind if you're asked about it in your interviews or whatnot, or if it comes up at some point, you wanna make sure that you're presenting the image you want to move forward with throughout your career. So if you have like, you know, something that maybe like, oh, Let's let's just take it down. Just take it down. Be sure that everything looks clean and good. Um, I also really appreciated what Brandon said about leveraging social media because that's very important. And I think Ruby mentioned it as well in her presentation about using AI because that can really help as well. Like that helped me with writing cover letters and fine tuning my resume and stuff. And especially when you're sending out a dozen resumes to different places using that. But when it comes to the writing based portfolio versus the, I think it was the visual film based portfolio. Yeah. I think what Brandon said about um, 
using your Instagram, you can use your Instagram to help put out your, the, if you're taking video or pictures and stuff like that, you can have a link to your professional Instagram page. You can also have links to, um, I think it's called WordPress. There's other, all kinds of like writing sites. Personally, I'm a Wattpad girl. I don't know how great that is today, but I, I love Wattpad. That's where I wrote a lot of my short stories and posted them and um, interacted with people. But if you find a place like Wattpad or WordPress where you can have your blogs or your writings posted as well, where you can engage with people, I think people can comment on stuff. Isn't WordPress, I feel like I'm saying the wrong thing. Uh, okay. I think that's right. I think that's right. That's it. Okay. But people can comment on it. You can share it and people can like your writings and all things like that. And you can have that linked onto your portfolio as well. And you can, there's a, you can have a page, a portfolio website where you display your videos, short clips, like have a little reel, have pictures put on there artistically, and you can have it linking to or, um, your scripts or whatever you want to present that's your writing samples you can have that there and just organize it in a way that looks beautiful and beautiful to the eye and presentable so there's a way to do it if you do both that's fantastic you know you can just utilize social media in that way like Brendan said thank you so much before we close because I do want to be respectful of everyone's time Ruby is there anything you'd like to add after this conversation I think everything that's been shared here has been just perfect. Um, I will say that when you do have um, a resume and a portfolio that you feel pretty good about, make sure you share it with people. Get uh, multiple people looking at it. Um, and it, it doesn't have to just be faculty or, you know, it can be family, you know, friends, roommates, you know, just get multiple people looking and giving you feedback on what you've put together. Um, and definitely, like Brandon and Autumn were, are, have been saying, reach out to those around you, faculty. Um, we're, we're, everybody is here to help. Um, so feel free to reach out. Yes, go ahead, Brandon. Okay, just really quick. And Ruby, you can add this to um, your presentation if you want to vet it. But one website that I recommended when I was living in LA a lot and people were looking for entry-level positions is entertainmentcareers.net. Oh, yes. There's a wide, there's a wide variety there. Um, and I know a lot of people who have had really great success with that. Um, and then just like my one final thought for outreach, you need to be starting your freshman year, but a really great entry point to building those relationships. People love to talk about themselves. So when you're reaching out, if you're doing it on Instagram or if you, again, I'm a big believer in the credits or like the people behind the scenes and setting a conversation or asking them to have a conversation about their history and experience and how they got started. It's a great icebreaker. Again, people love to talk about their experiences. Um, and that's a great way to build the foundation of a relationship where then later on, you know, as you're graduating, you can leverage some of these people because it wasn't an immediate request for something. It was truly about getting to know them and what their circumstances and situations were. Um, so that's a great entry point to just starting conversations without asking for something. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ruby. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Autumn. Um, thank you to Sophia and Alex, our student moderators. Um, this has been so helpful, we hope, for all of you, um, and we look forward to seeing you um, when we host another one of these, and have a great rest of your day.